So what we're going to do today is we're going to get into the Benford Law chapter. I hope to be able to do Benford's Law chapter in one day because this is what grad school is going to be like. You've spent a lot of time doing the Fourier analysis. We're going to get dividends. The biggest input we need from the Fourier analysis chapter is one. I guess I can't say biggest and then just say two things. So I'll just say it's the Poisson summation. That's the biggest input from the Fourier analysis. We are also going to need the fact that if we have an infinite sum, we can interchange the derivative and the sum. That is useful for a lot of the arguments in Benford's law. We want to be able to differentiate term by term. So because of that, I thought I would go carefully through the proof of when you can justify saying the derivative of an infinite sum is the infinite sum of the derivatives. We saw some examples where that failed. We looked at things like cosine of 2 to the nx over n squared that converged but we couldn't differentiate because we got these very high powers coming down from the cosines. So what I want to do is I want to go through the proof. It's a three epsilon argument. There's a lot of proofs and analysis like this. And this is going to be a good way to see some of the techniques. So proof that inside radius of convergence, the derivative of the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity, of a n x to the n, is the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity, of n a n x to the n minus 1. And so I'm going to just record some inputs. The first is the limit as n goes to infinity of n a n, an absolute value to the 1 over n, is the same as the limit as n goes to infinity of a n to the 1 over n. And the, re and the reason this is true if you're here to fix the things, we fixed it. Did you? Yep, turns out it was nothing a tall student and a spatula couldn't handle. <laughs> so, it is an amazing spatula. Uh, it's available now with Ginsu knives. Okay, so it turns out that these two limits are the same. And because they're the same, if one of the series converges, the other series converges. So we will restrict ourselves to a region where we are inside the absolute convergence. We will assume that x, h, and x plus h are all strictly less than rho minus epsilon for some epsilon. You know, because we're inside the region of absolute convergence, we can assume that we are sufficiently small. In fact, we could even make it a little bit safer and assume it's rho minus 2 epsilon and give us a little freedom to play with later. So we're just not too close to the boundary. All right, what else are we going to need? Uh, we know. We know it's true for finite sums. Right? There's no problems with finite sums. And we also know the tails decay. So if we look at just what goes on from some big N onward, we can make that as small as we want. So the contribution from the tails in this is very, very small. And the last thing we know, well, the last thing we know that is going to be very useful, is if I look at a to the n minus b to the n, this is a minus b times a to the n minus 1 plus a to the n minus 2b plus dot 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 plus b to the n minus 2. I mean n minus 1, sorry. And one way to see an identity like this has to be true is if I have a to the n minus b to the n. If I set that equal to 0, I expect to have n solutions. There's one obvious solution to a to the n minus b to the n equals 0. What's the obvious solution? A equals b. Well, if a equals b is a solution, then this has to be divisible by a minus b. And then that gives you the remainder. And you're going to get you know, telescoping sums. Everything will cancel. In the applications, we'll take a to be x plus h. We'll take b to be h. All right, so that's the setup for the problem. I will right, we'll see if the camera's going to pivot. Yes, the camera's pivoting today. OK. So now what we want to do is we want to go through the calculation. So we're going to use the definition of the derivative. f prime of x is going to be the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So in problems like this, you always want to go back to what do we know? This is the definition of the derivative. So we're going to look at this quotient for fixed h that's not 0 and then see what happens. So we get f of x plus h minus f of x over h. After a little bit of algebra, it'll be the sum n less than or equal to, say, big N of a n x plus h to the n 
minus x to the n over h minus a n x to the n minus 1 plus a sum n greater than n of a n x plus h to the n minus x to the n over h minus a sum n greater than n of n a n x to the n minus 1. <coughs> and because I'm in the region of absolute convergence, I'm inside the disk, everything is fine. We have three different pieces to analyze. And we're going to want to send the limit as h goes to 0. Which is the easiest piece to analyze? 1, 2, or 3? Three. 3. OK, so 3. There's actually multiple correct answers for this one. Why is 3 easy? It's a tail of a convergent. So a tail of convergent series. So there exists, we'll call it an n3. And the reason I'm saying n3 is it's going to be the n coming from this term, such that for all n greater than or equal to n3, in absolute value at most, and let's be fancy, epsilon over 3. OK? So this tail is not going to be a problem. And the reason is we're within the range of absolute, we're in the disk. All right. This one is actually the hardest. That's the one that's going to require some work. What about this one over here? And when is it 0? Oh, when h is 0, yeah. When, right, so as h goes to 0, this goes to 0. This is the region where it's finite. So in here, everything is finite. We're OK. We can control things. So we have a double thing going on. We have an h and we have an n, but big N is fixed. So if we choose a big N sufficiently large, we'll be OK. <coughs> All right. So I'll let you write down the details on this. But here, the key fact is that it's a finite big N. And now we send h to 0, we're OK. So because n is finite, as h goes to 0, this is not going to be any problem. So we're not going to have n and h simultaneously moving. We'll fix a giant big N. And then we'll let h go to 0. And then we'll see that this is less than epsilon. And again, big N here is just a helping variable for us. We don't care about big N. We just care about big N in so much as it can help us. Okay? So we all agreed that all that's left is understanding this middle piece over here. All right, so now we want to understand that middle piece. So how do we do that middle piece? Well, we're going to use this stuff over here. So we know we don't need this anymore. We will use the fact that the absolute value of x absolute value of h, absolute value of x plus h is less than rho minus 2 epsilon. And so now, when we look at that term, so the second piece, that's just going to be the sum n greater than n of a n. And now what do we have? We'll have the sum k goes from 1 to n minus 1 of x plus h to the k, h to the n minus 1 minus k. And the reason is I'm dividing by h. And when I divide by h, that gets rid of the x plus h minus x. I don't have, and then my sum over here, I start off at n minus 1. I go all the way down. Oh, so maybe, I'm sorry, bless you. K should go from 0 to n minus 1. This is the sum I have. We've got to be a little bit careful because the number of terms I have is n. And I've got to be careful because I've got a lot of things moving at the same time, and I want to be very careful how things move. And so the difficulty is, well, h is going to 0, but how is h going to 0? Maybe as h goes to 0, n is getting really large because I have a lot of terms from here. Maybe it's enough to compensate, but then h gets even smaller, but, h, but maybe, you know. You want to do things very carefully, keep one thing fixed, let one thing change. <coughs> now, the other thing is, do we know anything about the sum of a n? We have a series that converges. Do we know anything about the sum of a n? 
How many people think the sum of an should converge? How many think it should diverge? Or at least it can If you multiply a n by something that's less than rho to the nth power, it converges. So the problem is a n by itself could be enormous. And when we expand things out here, we've got little n terms. So there could be a danger here. But what we can do is we can say, look, in absolute value, it's less than or equal to the sum n greater than n, the absolute value of a n, and then it's going to be n times the maximum of x plus h, absolute value of h, to the n minus 1. Because the number of terms I have is n terms. And whichever one of these factors is largest, just take that to the nth power, or the n minus first power. And now I have what I want, because by assumption, both of these are less than rho minus 2 epsilon. So it's less than that. So now I have things that converge. So this is at most rho minus 2 epsilon, and that has the same limit as before. <laughs> so same uh, nth root as before. So the series converges. So if the whole series converges, if you choose big and small enough, you're in the tail. So n sufficiently big, you're in the tail. And that's the proof that this converges and that you can interchange the sum of the derivative. This is a one-time cost. Once you prove this, you can now differentiate freely inside the disk of convergence. So this is a great result to have. All right, but there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's worthwhile to go through and write this all up very carefully. There's a lot of great in analysis ideas here. Okay. Any questions about this proof? Yes? When you say you choose a big N, and, well, when I, when I had chose a big N, I, had it, it put, I put it in terms of H. OK. And that, that helps me get that first term. The, or should the fact <coughs> just be that you pick up the Ns? Well, the, the other thing is it, doesn't even, it really doesn't matter what your big N is over here. So you can just say there is an N. Well, so we'll say, as long as big N is finite, it really doesn't matter what's going on for the first term. Once these two terms are small, when you send H to 0, that doesn't affect this term. It's still going to be at most epsilon thirds. This term over here, I'm approximating you know, with this stuff over here, I've got that small. And then, the and then the final term is just going to be a finite sum. Be, you know, once, once I choose a large big N, I actually don't need to use any knowledge of this part in choosing big N. I just need to use this part and this part. So I choose big N large enough so that this tail is small. And I choose big N large enough so that this tail is small. Right, but you don't want the first, I thought you don't want that to be just a finite sum. This? Yeah. No, I want it to be a finite sum. Well, well, no, but, but it, because it's a finite sum, as h goes to 0, this is the definition of the derivative. Okay. You know, this is just the derivative of the function x to the n, which we know there's only finitely many terms. Okay. I can interchange the derivative and the sum here because it's finitely many terms. Okay. So this big N doesn't really matter what it is here. Here, it does matter. And then I choose basically the maximum of these two. So if this had to be 1,000, this had to be 10,000, I would choose anything larger than 10,000, and both will be safe. Yes? So even if you substitute, substitute the last bit, if you put rho minus 2 epsilon in there, how do you know that the sum converges? Well, be because this is exactly what we had when we were looking at the function, you know, the sum of n, a, n, x to the n minus 1. It has the same radius of convergence because n, a, n has the same radius of convergence. Yeah. And now I'm multiplying it by something that's less than rho in absolute value to the n minus first power. I, maybe I'm supposed to multiply by the nth power, fine. Put in an extra rho minus 2 epsilon and divide by rho minus 2 epsilon. So this, you know, there's a lot of ideas in here to write this up very carefully, very rigorously. And you've got to decide, do you like this or not? The advantage is once you become a professional analyst, you never have to do this. You basically just say, you know, by the standard 3 epsilon argument or something along these lines, and people assume that you're trustworthy. So I took off, I think, maybe like one or two points on a lot of your 
last problems with the Weierstrass theorem coming from the Fayer theorem just because you didn't put in enough details. In any professional paper, you would, what, what you wrote would be worth full credit. I just want you to get into the habit of being able to justify and explain everything. Okay. So we now have 50 minus 20, which if I'm correct, comes to 30 minutes to do Benford's Law. All right. It's kind of hoping we'd have a number of minutes beginning with a 1, but that might be too tough to do. All right, so by now you've read Benford's Law several times. That was one of the first assignments you had in the semester. I've asked you to read chapter 9, so I'm going to just very quickly describe it. It's a law of digit bias. And we say a sequence or a data set or a random variable. Um, so it's Benford base B if the probability uh, leading digit of D is the log base B of 1 plus 1 over D. Or more generally, I can write X as the significant of X base B times, so I'm doing things base B. So here, this is between 1 and B. This is an integer. It's basically just padding how many zeros I have. And if I want to look at the leading digit, I just care about, you know, does SB of X start with a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4? And you can do stronger things than Benford. You know, Benford is initially just talking about the first digit. I can talk about first two digits, first three digits. More generally, you could say, you know, the probability, the significant, is less than equal to S, is the log base B of S. And if you try to say what's the probability you start off with you know, digit D, it would be the log base B of D plus 1 minus the log base B of D. So probability you have a D would be the log base B of D plus 1. <laughs> Bless you, that's the probability the significant is at most D plus 1 minus the log base B of D. That's the probability the significant is at most D. So the difference is all of those whose significant is exactly starting with the D. And now by just properties of the logarithms, that becomes the log base B of 1 plus 1 over D. OK. So when I want to study numbers, what I care about is I only care about the significant if I just care about the digits. All this K of X does is it pads with a bunch of zeros in the B area expansion. So now, when I try to figure out what's going on, it's, a, it's enough to study not the original sequence, but a related sequence. And so we often do the following conversion. Given x, we pass to y is the log base b of x mod 1. And what that would be is that's just going to be the log base b of the significant of x. And that's going to be in the interval 0, 1. And the reason is the smallest the significant can be is 1. The largest it can be is b. So this is going to just map my numbers to the interval 0, 1. Benford's law of digit bias actually becomes the uniform distribution when you do this. And so if you can get into the habit of whenever you see numbers taking the logarithms base b and then throwing away the integer part, you will no longer see any bias. And you will no longer discriminate. I do not recommend this. And if somebody asks you, you know, what's the temperature outside? You know, what's the probability the socks will lose? You know, these are things you want to answer in the natural units. You do not want to do something like this. Benford's law is fascinating in how many different systems exhibit Benford behavior. And there's a lot of reasons why this is happening. Uh, my favorite explanation is through central limit theorems, is that you have a lot of different processes that are normally distributed. And it turns out they're normally distributed on a log scale. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few moments. All right, so if I want to study a number x, it's equivalent to study this related sequence y. And so now we have things on the interval 0, 1. And what's nice is Benford's law becomes equidistribution here. And let's think about what's going on. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Here's 0, 1. Let's do things base 10 because we're a little bit more used to thinking base 10. If I exponentiate 
10 to the 0 is 1, 10 to the 1 is 10, and if I want to look at all the numbers whose first digit is a 1, it's all the numbers which when I exponentiate get to 2. And so anything up to the log base 10 of 2 will have first digit 1. And the reason is if I, it's you know, the definition of logarithm. If I raise 10 by the number of powers of 10 I need to get 2, what do I get? Not surprisingly, 2. And so if you're uniformly distributed down here, you're going to have a bias over here because the log of 2 base 10 is approximately 0.3. So the real question becomes which sequences have logarithms that are uniformly distributed, modulo 1. And so this is where Professor Silva and I, if we were teaching, we would have a slight difference of how we would prove things. So because I'm the teacher, we're going to do chapter 12 the way I want to do it, through basically a more number theoretic approach. You could also do this through ergodic theory. Both good approaches. And there's a lot of interplay between number theory and ergodic theory, a lot of really good people working in fields like this. If you are interested in stuff like this for grad school, let me know. I can put you in touch with some of the people. But it's wonderful the types of results we get when these two subjects combine. So over here in something like this, the question becomes, how do we show something is equidistributed on 0, 1? Anybody have any thoughts of what kind of techniques could be useful to analyze functions on 0, 1? Yes. I'm sorry? LP spaces. Um, Something related to LP, so I mean, we'll be using some functions, but not quite. Poisson summation. summation, and this is coming from Fourier. Fourier series, Fourier analysis, right? There's a, probably a reason why we started off by doing chapter 11 and spending all that time. We're now looking at functions on 0, 1. We have all these tools and techniques to analyze functions on 0, 1. So, how many of you have ever seen the wish list of mathematics? Have you ever seen the wish list of mathematics? No, no. Fg prime is? F prime g prime. True or false? True. Really pushing that envelope of I will not remember bad answers. <laughs> a squared plus b squared equals c squared implies a plus b equals c. I'm sorry? That's the most correct thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Princess Bride? Have you seen The Princess Bride? Ah, uh, hide. Mostly dead? The square root of a squared plus b, uh, the square root of a plus b is the square root of a plus the square root of b. <laughs> Hell no. All right? This is false. e to the 2 pi i x mod 1 equals e to the 2 pi i x. Yeah, that one's actually true. <laughs> normally, you can't just throw away parts of an argument. You can't normally just throw away, oh, yeah, I'm not going to bother modding by 1. I'm going to just do the operation anyway. Yeah, the square root of a plus b mod 1 is the same as the square root of a mod 1 plus the square root of b mod 1. I don't really have to be careful where I put the mods. This is one of the few places where you don't have to worry. And in fact, I'm going to rewrite this maybe in a more illuminating manner. Instead of using the letter x, I will use the letter Nope. Nope. From what we were doing over here, what letter should I be using? I transformed x to y. to y. And so this is the whole reason why Fourier analysis is so beautifully suited to problems in Benford's law. Because when I'm looking at something modulo 1, it's not going to affect anything. And normally, if I, if I want to take the logarithm of a number, taking the logarithm of a number, that's not so bad. I can take logarithms of numbers. 
taking the logarithm of the number modulo 1, that's a much harder operation to do, to deal with that mod 1. Wouldn't life be so much better if you could just ignore that? Is it harder than like algebraically? Yes, yeah. In terms of being able to manipulate the functions and work with it, we can just drop the mod 1. So again, you want to get a sense of which tools work and why. Why is Fourier analysis going to work so well? Because you can just ignore the log 1 and not have any mistakes made. Now, it turns out, um, do people know that there are other languages than English? I was hoping somebody would say something like we or da. Or. So if you go to grad school in mathematics, depending on where you go, they may still have a language requirement. I had to demonstrate proficiency in two out of French, German, and Russian. A lot of schools are now down to one. Some schools are down to zero. You may have to do that. In ma yes? So I'm just a quick question. Yes. Memorize, short-term memory, short-term memory. And so you look at the program. Uh, they're usually pretty generous. They want you to be able to translate an article for the most part. So if they give you an article in French, you have no problem. I remember some of my friends when I was at Yale were complaining in the physics graduate exam. They got Einstein's theory of general relativity. And they said, we have enough trouble reading Einstein in English. You know, giving us Einstein in German or French was you know, not the best article to give. Some writers are more flowery and have you know, finer language than others. It may be nice if you're a native speaker, but if you're trying to understand, it's harder. For the most part, I can read mathematical French without any difficulty. You know, I know enough Spanish, and I know enough English, but I'm OK. <coughs> German is all short-term memory. My German is gone. Um, but you need to, you know, depending on where you go, this is something you may need to do. So if you haven't taken any languages yet, it would be interesting if you argue to have Chinese accepted. I think a lot of programs, if they could find an examiner in Chinese, might accept it. Okay, MIT accepts Chinese now. I know somebody, I'm sorry? Cornell takes it, yeah. I'm not surprised that people are taking Chinese. Uh, I know people in previous years who tried to get other languages and they were deemed not mathematical enough. And so a lot of it is to look at where is the literature being done? Is anybody actually writing in this language or are there important papers written in this language? There's still a lot of good math in, in German or Russian or French that has not been translated, or maybe not be readily available translated. And so it is useful to be able to pick up and read the original. The reason I'm doing this diversion is for twofold. Is one is to just alert you to what might be out there in grad school, and the second is I'm doing everything in terms of the Fourier transform. There's an analog of the Fourier transform called the Mellon transform. And the difference between the Fourier transform and the Mellon transform is basically a logarithmic change of variable. Oh, that's exactly what's going on here. So everything I'm doing on the, after I take the logarithm and looking at 0, 1 and using the Fourier transform, you could actually attack the problem very similarly without doing a logarithm and doing things with the Mellon transform. It's just a question of which one do you prefer. I'm more comfortable with the Fourier transform, so I normally take logarithms. And then I'm trying to prove uniform distribution on 0, 1. You could do it without, not a big deal. All right, so there's a lot of problems we can do. Uh, the first set of problems was looking at recurrence relations. And so I'm not going to go through the theory of recurrence relations. You know, by now, you're all graduate students. You should have seen recurrence relations many times. If not, I will post some links on recurrence relations so that you can read more. Some recurrence relations are easier than others. The 3x plus 1 is actually a very difficult recurrence relation to satisfy. Uh, simple ones, you know, constant coefficient recurrence relations are much easier. And in the book, uh, we show that constant coefficient linear recurrence relations are Benford so long as the largest root is not 1 and that its coefficient in the generalized Binet formula is non-zero. And it's a basically it's a bookkeeping argument. And it all comes down to the following key fact. If alpha is not rational, then um, n log alpha mod 1 is equidistributed in 0, 1. What does this mean? Here's 0, 1. Choose any interval a, b. Then it means the number of n less than equal to n such that n log alpha mod 1 is an a, b divided by the length 
of the interval b minus a times n goes, I'm sorry, divided by n goes to b minus a. So what it's saying is in the limit, the fraction of the time that I land in the interval a, b is just the relative size of the interval to the whole thing. That's what equidistributed means. So if this has length 2 thirds, 2 thirds of the time I'm in here. If it's 1 fifth, 1 fifth of the time I'm in here. This is the key fact in many proofs of Benfordness, that we have this kind of equidistribution. When I was first learning the subject, I did not truly appreciate that this is not enough information for some applications. So there's a question you should be asking. So let's say I tell you we have a sequence that's equidistributed, so this condition holds. What would you love to know? So I tell you this condition holds. What would you like to know? What's a good question to ask? Ex excellent. How fast? So I want to know some control over what are my fluctuations. So what this is telling me is th that in the limit, the number of times I'm in this interval is basically b minus a times n plus a lower order error. What is that lower order error? Is it of size n divided by log n? Is it of size maybe square root of n? The smaller that error, the faster the convergence. And so frequently what you want is you want a power savings, that the error term is actually n to the 1 minus delta for some delta greater than 0. And so I'm going to give you a link to my paper with Alex Kontorovich on you know, Benford's law on various things. And the key step was we needed to show we had a quantified rate of equidistribution. And the exponent we got, we had n to the 1 minus delta. For us, I think we had delta was approximately 10 to the negative 602, something like that. So you know, we had a positive delta. Okay? I think this is the largest finite number that has meaningfully occurred in any paper I've worked on. Not, not by far in mathematics. But we went through the proof and we did not want to do things optimally. We just, you know, we just needed some number, we didn't really care. And so it all comes down to how well can you approximate numbers. So this is another theme we can cover later in the semester, is if I give you an irrational number, how closely can I approximate that irrational number by rationals? It turns out the better approximable alpha is, that's going to have consequences on how rapidly this becomes equidistributed. Yes. I, and why do you think that's the case? Because if it's, if it's more approximable, then it will behave more like irrational as you take n powers of it, which means that it will land Excellent. More, more, into, more space outside the interval AB. Excellent. So here I wrote alpha is not in Q. What if alpha is Q? What if alpha is in 1 fifth? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I want log of alpha, sorry. Log of alpha not in Q, sorry log of alpha not in Q. So I want the log of alpha not in Q, then n log alpha mod 1 is equidistributed. Let's say the log of alpha is 1 fifth. So I'm going to look at 1 fifth, 2 fifths, 3 fifths, 4 fifths, 5 fifths mod 1 is 0, 6 fifths is 1 fifth, 7 fifths is 2 fifths. So unfortunately in a situation like that, I just keep cycling among several values. So if the log of alpha is rational, I'm only going to hit those values. So I need the log of alpha to be irrational. Why is this coming into play? And why did I forget the logarithm? Well, what I'm really looking at is I'm looking at the sequence xn is alpha to the n. And then I look at the related sequence yn is the log uh, base b of xn which is going to be n log base b of alpha. And so that's my fixed number. So if I let beta equal the log base b of alpha, then the theorem is that beta is irrational implies n beta mod 1 is equidistributed. And so then the question becomes, how do we show that beta is irrational implies equidistribution? 
That's chapter 12. So equidistribution means it falls evenly in the whole interval 0, 1. Can you think of something that is related to this but much weaker? So rather than assuming it falls evenly in 0, 1, what's a weaker thing we could go for? falls all over that it's dense. So it turns out it's a lot easier to prove that it's dense. So what that means is you give me any point and I can find infinitely many points that are arbitrarily close to this in my sequence. That's not going to be enough for Benford behavior, but it at least tells you there's a chance. So sometimes when you have a hard theorem you're trying to prove, try to see if you can prove an easier case first. And if you can't prove the easier case, you know, no chance on the main result. Try to build some intuition, try to see what's going on, maybe those techniques will be useful. And so in chapter 12, we'll talk about how you would prove that this is dense, and then going from dense, how you would prove that it is um, equidistributed. I mean, if you want to go the ergodic theory route, you can, you can approach it along those lines. And you've got to make sure that the, the proof is rigorous, but all right. So going back to the recurrence relations, I'm not going to go through the calculations, but the main idea is the following. So here's a quick sketch for recurrence. So we have some relationship A, N, equals C1 A n minus 1 plus C k A n minus k. C1 through C k are fixed. And are given initial conditions. You have the characteristic polynomial um, R to the k minus C1, R to the k minus 1 minus uh, CK equals zero. You get roots R1, R2, dot, 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 RK. If distinct, it turns out a general solution is AN is alpha 1, R1 to the N plus alpha K, RK to the N. OK? So they owe us munchkins. All right. So we have a general solution like this. If we have repeated roots, you have to tweak this a little bit. Let's assume we have distinct roots. As n gets very, very large, whichever root is largest is going to dominate the value of an, so long as its coefficient is not 0. So if you look at the Fibonacci numbers, the coefficient of the Fibonacci numbers is going to be non-zero you know, for the largest one. So so Fibonacci's, we would get Fn is 1 over root 5, 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n, minus 1 over root 5, 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the n. And these are the roots of the characteristic polynomial. Okay, and so as these are the roots of the characteristic polynomial, there we go, this is going to be my solution. And this is called Binet's formula. Several of you have heard me comment on this numerous times. It is one of my favorite formulas in mathematics. This is one of the reasons I keep teaching it. Does this look like an integer? So what joke do I make at this point? You should know by now. Police lineup, right? If you were to see this number in a police lineup and you were asked to identify the integer that was bothering you mathematically, <laughs> would you point to this as an integer? Probably not, which means you've learned nothing from me. <laughs> but before, before this, you wouldn't have pointed to it. But now, of course, we, we, we know it's being disguised. Right? And we can see through this. Even though it's got square roots, even though it's got divisions by 2, it's an integer. This part is less than 1 in absolute value. So as n gets very large, this part's negligible. This part is greater than 1 in absolute value. This part explodes. So when n is big, fn is approximately 1 over root 5, 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the n equals 1 over root 5 uh, phi to the n, where phi is the golden mean. Yes? Uh, I was wondering if we know how to find the alphas in general. 
So the way you would find the alphas in general is you would use initial values of the recurrence relation. So we take n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to k minus 1. And then we would have a system of linear equations. We would have k equations, k unknowns. We would get a matrix. If the r's are distinct, you get what's called a Vandermond matrix, and it's always invertible. And it's a beautiful fact. Uh, the Vandermond matrix actually occurs again in random matrix theory. So depending on which way we go this semester, we might actually meet the Vandermond matrix again. And so we can solve this. This is very similar in spirit to some of the things you get in induction when you try to write sums of squares, sums of cubes, sum to the fourth powers. If you don't know the formula to try to prove for what the sum of the fourth powers are, it's much harder to prove it by induction. But if you just say, hell with it, it's got to be a polynomial, everything else is a polynomial. If I'm summing things to the fourth power, probably sum to the fifth power. I know the constant term has to be zero, because if I just take a sum of zero to the fourth, I get zero. The leading term from calculus, if I'm summing n to the fourth, it's got to look like n to the fifth over five. So it's got to be a leading term of one-fifth n to the fifth plus something. You can then just take a few terms, evaluate them, guess the coefficients from linear algebra, and now do your induction. That's fine if I give you a number like 4. If I give you a number like 24601, it's not nearly as much fun, but it's doable. You know, in principle, it can be done. So when, yes? So if you have a recurrence relation that's given by a matrix, and if is the characteristic polynomial the same, or the relevant characteristic polynomial? In terms of like the determinant of A, they're, they're basically the same. It's basically all the eigenspaces are one-dimensional. Oh, it yes, it it's exactly. Is that you don't have any generalized eigenvectors. Everything is just a full eigenvector. OK, so coming back over here, when n is really big, fn is approximately 1 over root 5 times the golden mean to the n. How do I understand benefitness? Well, I study the log base 10 of fn mod 1. And that's going to be n log base 10 of phi minus one-half the log base 10 of 5. This is a constant. I'm adding this to every single thing. Is this going to affect? No, it's just going to translate my whole distribution. So this just is a constant shift. I don't have to worry about that at all. And all we need to show now is that the log of phi base 10 is irrational, and we're done. All right, so let's assume not. So assume log base 10 of phi is rational implies the log base 10 of 1 plus root 5 over 2 equals a over b. So 1 plus root 5 over 2 equals 10 to the a over b. Now what should I do? So I want to get a contradiction. How can I get a contradiction from this? Raise both sides to the bth power. And if I raise both sides to the bth power, when I multiply this out, I'm always going to have a root 5 term. And the reason I'm going to have a root 5 term is the coefficients here are all positive. So this is going to have a root 5 term. So this is going to equal blah plus blah tilde root 5 over 2 to the blah double tilde, something like that. Oh, actually, we know exactly what it is, over 2 to the b. <laughs> Hence the blah, right? That's what the left-hand side is going to look like. 10 to the a, that's an integer. I, mo I move the 2 to the b over to the other side, and I've got root 5 is now an integer. Contradiction. So we know that this is false, and therefore, this becomes equidistributed by the result we claimed. The reason we haven't quite proven benefitness now is because we have this little, little bitty correction. So if we didn't have this, we would be benefit. But this becomes so small, you can then try to ask, well, how much can it really change the probabilities? And if you just choose n to be sufficiently large, the amount you're changing by is so small. Let's say here's 0, here's 1, here's the log, base 10 of 3, the log, base 10 of 4. 
and you want to look at all the things that have a first digit of, four, of three. The only way it can do you some harm is if you're just a little bit before three and it pushes you over, or you're just a little bit below four and it pushes you above. And all you have to do is estimate, well, if n is really large, you know, if this is becoming equidistributed, what fraction is this going to be? You can make this less than epsilon. And now you just have to do some bookkeeping. So bookkeeping happens really. OK, yes? And be able to show that that's not a big deal, even if you're trying to do the continuous version, the log base b of s? Correct. Right, because if you're doing log base b of s, then what you would be doing is here's 0, here's 1, here's the log base b of s. And now it would be a small part there being pushed over and a small part here being pushed forward. And so this is now just bookkeeping and showing that the amount that it's moved by is so small, it's not going to make a difference. OK, so I am very happy with all the questions that are being asked today, and I was very happy to do the discussion about the proof of interchanging series and summation. You know, I was hoping physicists would be walking by as we did this, but oh well, you know, we had at least other people coming in. So we'll finish up the benford -ness on Wednesday. I'm not going to go into all the details of the 3x plus 1, but if you're interested in something like that, by all means take a look and see how the irrationality of the number affects the rate of convergence. And if people want, you know, send me an email. I'm happy to go into a little bit more detail in this, show you some of the data in the numerics, talk a little bit more about the theory. After this, I thought we would then go into chapter 12, do a little bit more of the Fourier analysis and prove things like Weil's equidistribution law, that if beta is irrational and beta mod 1 is equidistributed. And then from this, we'll move into the circle method. So we're beginning to see lots of applications. Another application of Poisson summation is going to be the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function. So again, there's a lot of stuff in modern analysis. I am trying to give you a tour that hits as many different landscapes as possible with as small of a set of material as possible so that you know, we can get as the, ma the maximum number of dividends. And you know, again, I'm not covering all the details in class deliberately. Okay, I realize I'm asking a lot for you. I realize we're moving at a great pace. This is what a graduate class is going to be like. You've got to be able to do the algebra. You've got to be comfortable reading the book and being prepared for the class. And I'm just going to try to hit the high points and give you the big picture. I strongly urge you to go home and fill in the details. If you want, I invite you to come to my office. When you became a Sonic graduate student, the older Sonic graduate students, I know this is being recorded, gave you a copy of Davenport's multiplicative number theory, which was out of print. And you went down, and I'll stop there as to what you did at the photocopy machine, because I'm not going to admit to anything on tape. You can look in my office, and I will show you something that has extensive notes in the margins. And I'm glad we had large margins. Because that's how you understand a book. That's how you understand something, is you go through and you do the details yourself in private or with somebody else in a small group. Okay.